good stuff. 1602, we go e4. Knight c6. So this is the Nimzovich defense. There are two basic choices here. You can go d4, but the, the simplest move is actually to go knight f3 because usually this transposes. There we go. This transposes f3, e5 into whatever uh, what, whatever you play here. Now, the downside of this is that you avoid the Vienna. If you're a Vienna player, you would want to go knight c3 here. But I would like to play the four knight scotch. Uh, as we've been doing thus far. And let's see how this works at, at a 1600 level. Now, I would say that people still struggle against this opening at this level. And there we go. This is already in an accuracy. And we might see c5, bishop e7. Black is already in huge trouble. What should white do here? And this can be punished very, very um, straightforwardly and in you know with, with, with tremendous strength. Yeah, black has failed to play d6, so of course we play e5. We push the knight back all the way to g8. Okay, knight h5 is a very typical mistake. Anytime there's a knight on h5 or a5, you have to make a mental association with a particular move. And this move needs to be like an automatic reaction to knight h5 or knight a5. This is sometimes even missed by grandmasters. So not bishop e2, because when you attack a piece with another piece, right, the, the the, le the lower value uh, a piece is, the better of an attacker it is, as I've discussed. Pawns, and this might sound paradoxical, but it's actually very straightforward. Pawns are the best attackers because if a pawn attacks a piece, you can't really defend that piece with another pawn. And therefore, the move is g4. Black can't really play g6 here. That's the logic. g4 traps the knight. Okay, this is game over. <laughs> and and the, in addition, black is, and, and here comes c5, so it's a double whammy. Um, Black has also opened the G-file for us, thank you very much. And now we need to sort of reorient ourselves toward attacking the king. So normally we would slide the queen back or maybe bring it to A4. But here specifically, I, I, I see a really nice square for the queen. Now a lot of you are tempted by queen G4, but uh, don't uh, forget to check for uh, your opponent's ideas, right? The bishop on C8. It's going to be X-raying the queen. Queen G4 allows the move D5, and black gets his pieces out um, rapidly. So where am I thinking about putting the queen here? Call me Ray sees it. I, am, I have my eye on queen E4. Why queen E4? Because, well, who can explain this to me? Why queen E4? Yeah, so we want to play bishop D3. But F6 is actually kind of an interesting move, because bishop D3 can now be met with the move F5. So I'd like to play a slightly more flexible move until black puts their cards on the table. So what attacking move can we make that we know for a fact uh, increases the strength of anything that we do on the, on, the, on the king side? Of course, the move is rook to one. Now, am I not worried about my king not being able to castle? Well, we weren't planning to castle that way anyway. If we want to castle, we'll castle queen side. Now that f takes e5 has been played, how does this impact the position? Well, if you think about it, that means black can't play f5. Why is it important that black can't play f5? Well, you tell me. Now we play bishop d3 and the game is over immediately. Right, very straightforward logic, and that's it. h7 is unstoppable, and boom, boom, boom. Yeah, we'll probably play another one. Because there's really nothing to analyze here at all. Okay, h6. Oh, we have a really pretty mate. If you guys want, um, look, find find the pretty mate. Now, there's mate in three, two different ways that I see. Yeah, rook g7. That's the elegant way to do it. King g7, and then either queen h7 and queen g6, or queen g6, queen h7. This is an interesting case of symmetry, right? You can Rarely is this the case. You can go this way, that way, or that way, this way. Um... Yeah, that's about it. Now, you could also play queen h7, queen g6, and queen g7. Easy game. Not much to talk about here. Again, you guys can see four knight scotch is a powerhouse at this level. I mean, nobody knows what to do against it yet. And people just tend to take on d4, right? Right. This is, this is already a mistake. And as we've discussed, black has to play d6 here. That's very important. Otherwise, we go e5. And here, knight g8 is the only move. But, um, you know, then we go bishop c4, and this is incredibly nasty, because the knight isn't even coming out to h6, because we can take it. Um, and 
Even GMs occasionally miss this, like, G4 idea. This is going to be an easy move to forget about. That's it. Castles, we take the knight. And the only subtlety is where to put the queen here, right? This is something that you acquire through experience, right? How do I know I want to put an E4? Well, I'm just very familiar with the idea of building a battery. And also, I'm incorporating the fact that this pawn on E5 essentially precludes F5 because we can always take on Passant. Understood? All right, let's play another one. That was that was easy. <laughs> 1613 from Zerejan as Zeka. Okay, E4. Well, um, let's... I feel like playing another Accelerated Dragon. Oh, no, never mind. White plays F4. This is really good. Uh, this is a move which, if you're a Sicilian player, you should definitely know how to respond to it. I, I don't know if it has a formal name. I think I informally refer to it as the Accelerated Grand Prix, because in the general Grand Prix, White plays Knight C3. And the way that you quote-unquote punish this, and I want to emphasize that this move is not a refutation of F4, but this is what, what is recommended in most uh, opening books, and I believe it's the best move, and that is d5. Now, I've, ha I've had this before in a speedrun. E takes d5, you don't take with the queen. You play knight f6, this is quite common in such positions. e5 essentially allows you to get a good French type of structure. So what should we do here? What is the, the almost automatic response in such situations? Not e6, no, 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 e6 literally transposes to a French. First, we get the bishop outside the pawn chain. You guys know that. First, we get the bishop outside the pawn chain, right? Then we play e6. Otherwise, everybody would do this. This would transpose into a French. Okay, and we don't have to rush with e6. We don't have to rush, rush with e6. We can start with knight c6. It's not like white's not going to play e6. Get our knight out first. This should be fine. Now, are we worried about the prospect of bishop takes e6 check? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say the answer is no. Uh, and as I'll show you guys after the game, this pawn structure specifically uh, is often quite problematic for black. And this is something that is very unique to these positions. So I'll flesh that out after the game through the lens of perhaps an over-the-board game. What is an elegant and active way to take the sting out of bishop takes e6? Well, what does it mean to take the sting out of this move? Well, it means to prepare to capture with a piece. Queen b6, definitely. Yeah, no, d5 there. Okay, so now we take with the queen and everything is groovy. We have preserved our pawn structure. And now it's time for us to develop our king side. d3. Okay, let's, uh, let's go e6. Now, the one issue in such situations is that if you would want to go knight f6, but you can't. So if you're a Karakon player, then you generally know how to approach the question of where to develop these. Where does the knight and bishop belong? Because there's not a lot of real estate on the king side that, um, you know, there's just not a lot of room there. So there's a couple of ways that you can address this. And the sort of textbook method is to start by going knight e7, knight g6, and then going bishop e7. But there are also a couple of other methods, um, some of them a little bit more creative. I don't like g6 because Fianchettoing the bishop is just biting on granite on e5. The more creative method is to get the knight out to h6 and the bishop on e7. Uh, the drawback of that is that white can go h3 and kind of put the knight out of commission. But I'm going to show you guys a really cool idea, an idea that I think is really cool. And we'll start with the move bishop e7. So we'll start with the, the most flexible developing move. And uh, as we discussed, so... Knight h6 allows h3, right? And the knight is out of commission. But if you watch, for example, Hikaru play uh, the Gurganidze, you might know that black is a very particular kind of move that is often played in such structures. Uh, it grabs space, and it also prepares something important. What am I talking about? It, and that is the move h5. So this does a couple of things. It prepares the move knight h6, which uh, we are now going to play. And let me now explain why. Now, if the pawn was not on h5 here, if the pawn was on h7, a little thought experiment, what move would be possible now for white? Nasty little move. If the pawn was on h7 right now instead of on h5, what could white do? White would be able to go g4. With the pawn being on h5, it's, prevent it's preventing g4, and it is allowing a further regrouping of pieces. Think about this knight on h6. Where do you really want it? What little re reshuffling? Can you propose here? Again, if you watch, if you're familiar with these structures, you should know about this. Bishop, 
Yeah, bishop g6 and knight f5, exactly. I guess white can play g... <laughs> White can play g4 here, but that allows us to open the h file, and I feel like the white king is going to be so exposed there that we don't have to worry about this move. Does that make sense? Why does the knight belong in f5? Well, it's just really good there. And we can also push this pawn down to h4. Perhaps we should have done that earlier, we could have done that earlier, and that completely prevents g4 because of the possibility of Anpasan. Okay, that is a blunder. Why? Knight d2 is... Just a blunder. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the center pawn. We will take it gladly. We can drop back and proceed with our plan. Gladly take that pawn. If you want to be really accurate, you might say, well, we don't even really have to bring the bishop back to g6. This bishop on e3 is perfectly safe. It can be supported by the move c4, or it can move back toward this diagonal. Um, But we don't need to... I, I actually don't like... But actually, no, let me think about this for a second. I don't love the immediate c4. Although, boom, boom, boom. We'll play it. Yeah, let's play it. But it, it, I, okay, this is very concrete. I don't like it positionally, but I think it works out tactically. Can somebody explain to me why I might be reluctant about playing this move from a positional standpoint? What is the drawback? And yes, it threatens bishop c5. I see that. But what is the drawback of this move from a positional standpoint? It, it weakens the d4 square. It creates a big hole on d4. Now, if you can defend that hole with your pieces and you can make sure of that, then this is fine. And it took me a while to figure out that we can. There we go. Our opponent tries to exploit it. What should we do? I know a lot of you are tempted by bishop c5. It's the right idea, but you don't want to give the bishop up for the knight. This dark squared bishop is very valuable. Look at how many weak dark squares white actually has. Instead, we bring the knight to f5 just in time. We bring the knight to f5 just in time. The move that I was trying to calculate for the record is g4 in this position. I think we're doing well after g4, but I had to work that out. And so, in an over-the-board game, I wouldn't go c4. I would, I would wait for a more opportune moment to play that. This is a very instructive moment. Because I can I, I'm sure that most of you are probably thinking, okay, now we should take. But I actually think we can squeeze more out of this position um, without taking on d4. Why do I, how do I know that? Why do I say that? Because if you take to, on d4, then the diagonal is plugged by the pawn. Whereas if we can get this knight off of d4, the threat of bishop c5 is going to become incredibly strong. Now, bishop c5 immediately blunders the queen. So do we want to play queen c5? No, well, we want the bishop on c5. So we want the queen on b6. Why does it check on a4? It's not scary. We just go king f8. Does this make sense? This logic makes sense. Now we're threatening knight takes d4 and queen takes d4. Knight f3. Okay. Intensify, intensify. Now the move is bishop c5. Now we're threatening to win a second pawn on d4. And we've got white basically tied up in knots. Bishop e3. We take it. We take those bishops. And this is what happens, right? When you put a sufficient amount of pressure on players in this rating range, generally you'll see, you know, these these kinds of blunders. Um, and that's not entirely uncommon, and it's totally normal. Okay. So, yeah. So f four, the move is d five, and there is quite a bit of theory here if you actually look at books and stuff. E takes d five. Uh, you go knight f6. You, you try to take this pawn on your own terms. And if white goes c4, then I I definitely have a speedrun game with this opening. I think our opponent went c4. So you can dig around uh, and search by opening. But after e6, the, the basic idea is that black has tremendous compensation for the pawn. And as I explained in that earlier video, uh, black's compensation hinges on three primary things. Um, let's see if you guys can name all three reasons that I have in mind. And th th there are different ways of looking at this position, so it's not like there's a clear, like, okay, this is how it is. This is just how I think about the position. Development is not really one of them, so that's an interesting way that my intuition differs from yours. Because white is going to get his king side developed, right? It, white can go knight f3, bishop two castles, so the development advantage is going to be uh, diluted in the next couple of moves. So first thing is the backward d-pawn and the 
more importantly, this d4 square is a giant weakness, right? As long as we have control over d4, we're making it very hard for white to develop. Um, the second thing is the open king, yes, and why is it open? Because there's a pawn on f4 and it's sticking out like a sore thumb. So even if white castles kingside, white's king is not going to be entirely out of the woods. And the fact that the pawn is on f4, it doesn't just weaken the king. I think a lot of people don't fully understand that. It creates spillover effects at, on other pieces. For example, if you think about a move like bishop b3, now it's always going to run into knight g4 because... There's no pawn on f2 to anchor that bishop. So it, it weakens the whole center, makes it hard for white to put pieces in the center, and it makes it hard for white to get this bishop somewhere active. So that's reason number two. And then reason number three um, is, is just that white's light squared bishop is terrible. It, it's perpetually, and both of white's bishops are terrible. You could, you could put it that way. Both of them are staring at pawns in the fourth rank. So this is a good way, you know, this I think this is a good kind of thing to do is just to look at a position, see if you can really deconstruct it and break it down into its component elements. Like black gets compensation for the pawn or you flip on the engine, you see that, okay, it shows a slight advantage for black and you really try to figure out why that is conceptually. Good. Um, but I won't delve further into the theory of this line. White doesn't have to go C4. White also has bishop B5 check here and knight C3 and you can do your own research but after e5 bishop f5 this is already really really good and and this is essentially a french with a pawn on f4 which is very much subpar and a bishop outside the pawn chain both of which are in black's favor obviously all right so let me see if i can find a a cautionary tale of what happens when you leave uh, when you allow when you allow uh, white to take on c6 and ruin your pawn structure okay let me see if i can find an example of this. Okay, so two two pretty good players you can see. White's a GM. Um, and basically they get the structure. They get the structure, right? And and what happens here is that first of all, white goes e5 in this position, which causes tremendous problems in black structure, right? It breaks up the whole pawn structure. If you take it, ugh, this is incredibly ugly. So White just clamps down in the position. But after black goes d5, we get the exact structure that we could have gotten in the game. And here's what white does. Knight a4, typical move in such positions. f6, bishop b3. What is white doing? Thank you, Favela. White is putting pressure on the c5 pawn. Why is that important? Because it makes it incredibly... Look how, how stuck black is. Black can't go knight b6. Black can't get the light squared bishop out. Black can't move the dark squared bishop. It's just incredibly hard to move around here because of these you know, this host of weaknesses on, the, 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 you know, in, in, in the, uh, on the queen side. And what black tries to take on e5, but then after the mass trade, queen f2, queen f3 is a nice move. Eventually white takes on c5 and look at this monster knight sitting on that outpost. And although black's pawn structure visually looks better, white's got this absolute monster knight. There's a pawn on a6 that's weak. Sorry, white doesn't take it. And white ends up, black ends up giving up the exchange, but losing the game rather quickly afterward. Hopefully that makes sense. This is not, not an ideal illustration, but I think it shows you the, the sort of the spirit of what I'm trying to say. Um, and so for that reason, we decided to go queen b6. Why allow this? So like, if you think about it, white can apply many of the same ideas that we just saw, bishop b3, knight bd2, knight b3, and start pressuring the pawn on c5. And if you ever go d4 in a position like this, you create big light square weaknesses. So queen b6. Now, does that mean you always have to be afraid of this? No, the structure isn't necessarily bad, but here there was just no need. So yeah, here we go, bishop b7. Um, and we adopt this h5 idea, knight h6, bishop g6, knight f5. You see this often in the Karakon. Um, if, if you're a Karakon player, um, if you're a Karakon player, you should definitely be aware of this idea. Again, I can show you a gazillion examples of this particular um, transformation of this particular setup. In fact, I think I actually played a game myself where I face this yeah so this is where i first learned about this this game so this is a game that i played in 2011 against a peruvian uh peruvian grandmaster and as you can see it was a Karokan, it was an advance and guess what he did 
knight h6. I was unfamiliar with this move back then. He didn't play h5. Um, so he played it without h5, but bishop g6, and then knight f5. So you can see it here. And who can explain to me why g4 is not scary in this position? Like, why is h5 unnecessary? Well, first of all, black castle's kingside, so he didn't want to ruin the kingside. But more importantly, there's simply knight h4, and white has created a lot of holes on the kingside. I later did play g4. In fact, I did play g4 on the very next move. But after knight h4, I ended up getting in a lot of trouble on the kingside. Because the thing is, like, f4, f6, and now the kingside is opened, and he sticks a bishop on e4 eventually. So he put me under a lot of pressure, although I managed to save the draw. Good stuff there. And back to the game. Yeah, so h3. Here we go h5 because we don't have to castle kingside yet. We can just keep our king in the center. Bishop back. He blunders the pawn, which helps our cause. I think I myself would have probably gone knight f5. Um, but yeah, we decided on this approach. And uh, queen b6 is an important move. So again, if we take it and go queen b6... Then white goes bishop b3, and your bishop on e7 doesn't really have a home. He could have taken queen h5 where? Oh, here? But then we have bishop c5, no? That was the point of c4, I thought. So not can't really do it concretely. Queen b6, knight f3, bishop c5. And uh, after bishop d3? No, but then we take the rook. The rook is hanging. The rook is hanging. Um, yeah, so so the key thing to establish here is whether we can keep these squares under control. And when I realized that I can, this, this is a move that took me a second to find. I also had to ensure that queen a4 isn't dangerous because of king f8. Because otherwise, you actually drop a rook. So this is important. Okay, obviously, bishop b3 eases our, our cause. But that's that's that. A um, lot of, lot of uh, positional concepts to flesh out in this game, even though it was short. But yeah, c5, f4, you want to go d5 straight away. And knight c3, which is the actual grand prix, you can either go knight c6 or d6 or e6, depending on... So here, depending on which, op which Sicilian you play against the open Sicilian, you want to calibrate your response to knight c3, because a lot of tricky people, they'll go knight c3, and if you're a knight arf player, for example, knight c6, they'll suddenly go knight f3. You're like, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. Right? You go d6, you get move ordered into a rouser. So if you're a knight or a flare, traditionally you're supposed to go d6 or a6 here. So that if white goes knight f3, you can go knight f6 and preserve uh, the, 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 the knight or setup. Or if you're a dragon player, same thing. If you're a dragon player, you can actually go g6 immediately. Uh, why not h4 to strengthen knight f Because we weren't afraid of g4, that was the point. Yeah, move, getting move order is annoying, and so that's one of the ways you can fine-tune your repertoire is to make sure that you're not susceptible to, to getting move ordered. So that's what I'll say. Okay, guys, I am going to call it a night. I'm tired. Thank you, guys. Thanks for hanging out. Have a good one. See you tomorrow.